Welcome back to the show, fellow conspiracy realist. We are returning to you this evening with a classic, a very, very wild interview that we did uh, in 2018. My, how the time flies. Jeez, what was that like? It feels like you're talking about in the 90s at this point. But this this conversation is about one of the things, guys, personally, it's one of my favorite things. I'm kind of obsessed with it. It's the concept of the Majestic 12. The um, It's a secretive, fabled group of people that's kind of close to the Illuminati, but with UFOs. Right, right. Majestic 12, the um, inner cabal of scientists and policymakers who apparently figured out that aliens were real and proceeded to participate in one of the greatest cover-ups in human history. Uh, in this interview, we speak with the author David Wilcock uh, regarding his own, his theories, his beliefs, his journey, uh, and how it pertains to his exploration of Majestic 12. Let's jump right in, y'all. From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. Our friend Noel is on some adventures. All will be revealed in time. Uh, but they call me Ben. We're with our super producer, Paul Deckett. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. And that makes this Stuff They Don't Want You to Know. A very special episode of Stuff They Don't Want You to Know, Matt. Yes, we had the opportunity of watching a documentary called Above Majestic. And we got to watch it a little ahead before it came out. And we are so excited today to be joined by one of the creators of this documentary, David Wilcock, who is a professional lecturer, filmmaker, and researcher. Uh, please, everyone, let's welcome David Wilcock. Well, thank you guys for bringing me on. Um, it's an honor to do your show. I had a career for a while repairing electronics, and um, I was intuitive with it. I would take things apart and figure out how they work, so... Seems like it's a good fit for me to be on your show. <laughs> uh, yes. yes. Fantastic. So, David, we wanted to first thank you for being so generous with your time today. Uh, your name is going to be familiar to a lot of us mm -hmm. in the audience in this episode. And over the course of your career, you have delved into multiple different avenues of research. You're a prolific author. Uh, we have we've seen several of your books, and we also, I guess, to to start at the beginning, um, we were reading through some of your early life experiences uh, available on your website here with um, some some experiences that people would call extraordinary occurring as early as age two or five. Is that correct? Yeah, definitely correct. I started to have very strange dreams that had cylindrical craft in them that did not have wings um, that were hovering over the backyard and uh, in some cases I was there with my mother um, it would appear that the craft in some of these dreams had landed and that they wanted me or I felt compelled to go to the craft I still have not remembered anything as far as if these were actual contact experiences but there's a lot of UFO contactees and insiders who work in highly classified government programs and i have been consistently informed by folks like this that sometimes these things that appear to be dreams are actually uh, screen memories or otherwise memories of things that did happen in other words there are lots of contacts happening lots of people are having contact experiences and it is not common for us to remember them it is very, very much more common that we don't remember them. And there's also lots of other contact experiences that do not involve the typical alien abduction from bug-eyed greys, as most people think. You know, the, the ET subject is far, far greater in complexity than the idea of grey aliens from Zeta Reticuli. Hmm. Wow. So 
Just for some of the members of our audience that don't necessarily outright believe in extraterrestrial life, what do you what do you feel is the most compelling evidence that just aliens are real essentially? It's it's very tough to pick one thing when you're dealing with a subject that is so vast in its scope and complexity. Uh, but I guess we can take a crack at a few things. First of all, back in the day of the 1980s, when I would watch documentaries about UFOs on network or cable TV, they would always have the skeptics in there. The skeptics would always say, oh, all of this has been discredited. One of the things they loved to use was this so-called Drake equation that looks very complicated with all these factors in it. And it was basically the scientist calculating that there's only going to be 2.17 civilizations in the, in the Milky Way galaxy. And I always wondered, well, what the heck does this 0.17 civilization look like? Is it just legs walking around with no body or what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating question, too, because we know statistically speaking, just given the size of not even the entire universe, just the part that we can observe, it's it's – virtually certain that there is some sort of other intelligent life or there was or there will be. Um, I think that's a very I think that's a very interesting conundrum because we run into what I would call sometimes the arrogance of skepticism. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well and and the fact is skepticism is no longer supported by the actual NASA data. And I say that because when we look at how exoplanets are discovered, it has to do with the occultation of the light coming from the star where there's subtle variations in its uh, luminance. And NASA has gotten to the point now where they can detect very subtle changes and they can detect the mass of the planet and they can also detect its approximate distance from the star. And NASA has also announced that stars are giving off hydrogen and oxygen which naturally combine in atmospheres to make liquid water. Therefore, any planet that is within what they're calling the Goldilocks zone that has the right size is going to have liquid water and is going to be Earth-like. So the official NASA estimates now of how many planets there are that are like Earth just in our galaxy alone, some of those estimates are as high as 80 billion. Wow. So try to imagine that, like, if you had, if you just went through our galaxy and you tried to go to every inhabited or, or every Earth-like planet, okay, let's forget inhabited for a minute, every Earth-like planet, um, then what's going to happen is every person on Earth would need to visit, what is it, like 12 planets, just to even visit them if there's 80 billion in our in our galaxy and then when they go into an estimate of how many earth-like planets there are in the universe it would actually be 1000 earth-like planets for every single grain of sand on the entire planet earth which is an insane comparison yeah, that's you a, know that's that's mind-boggling the idea there's, there's one yeah. guy listening on three hits of acid and he understands this but nobody else does. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> hey, <laughs> write us an email, buddy. <laughs> Please do. Uh, I think his name is Johnny Planet, and he's he's awesome. Uh, so if the, one of the big uh, issues, I guess, with having – even if we have this many civilizations and this much intelligent life in the universe, traversing the distance that you would need to mm -hmm. just to visit even the next solar system, uh, it becomes a tremendous problem. Uh, how do you see that actually working in, in in reality right now? So you have to understand that we are dealing with a particular set of science, which we now believe to be sacrosanct and inviolable. And we take ourselves to be a modern civilization where most of the mysteries of science, laws of physics have been cracked and accessed. And it turns out that this really is not true. Um, one of the most significant contributions I feel I've made to collective human knowledge is to explore a lot of different aspects of alternative science and to find out just how lacking much of our science has been. Uh, so like as an example, 
there's this one Russian physicist named Dr. Vladimir Ginsberg. And Dr. Ginsberg went back and looked at Einstein's relativity equations. And you will notice that the most common debunking that these skeptical uh, individuals would usually use about the idea that nobody could reach light speed or even exceed light speed is this concept of mass increase. So when you look at the Einstein relativity model, one of the things that Einstein says is that as you approach light speed in your velocity, that your mass continues to get larger and larger to such a degree that once you reach light speed velocity, that your mass would now be the size of the entire universe. It, it literally goes to infinity. Hmm, wow. So way back in the day, in the 80s, when you used to watch these shows, they'd bring this up sometimes. Skeptics would and say, yeah, it's just impossible. Nobody's ever going to be able to reach us. We're all trapped in this slow morass, and there's no way out. So I brought up Vladimir Ginsburg. Well, Ginsburg produced a very interesting realization. The Einstein equation that leads to this idea of mass increase at light speed velocity is an equation that is based on a fraction. And the cool thing about fractions is that you can manipulate them, and that includes tipping them upside down, where the bottom goes to the top, the top goes to the bottom. I'm speaking in simple language now, but you get the point. And when you, when you flip the fraction of the Einstein equation, it doesn't violate any laws of physics to turn it upside down. Everything still works fine. All the equations we know and love still check out. Everything plugs through in a proper manner. However, now as you reach light speed, instead of your mass increasing, your mass decreases. And so his conclusion, and also I would concur with his conclusion, is that it's mass displacement. And that means mass is displacing into an alternate reality, an alternate dimension, as you approach light speed. Well, this is very, very useful, and I'll tell you why. And, and again, I've done three books, you know, two of which are New York Times bestsellers, and the total amount of academic references in these three books is, is over 2,000. Okay, so it only takes 120 to 150 to, to do a PhD. So there's a lot of stuff, I, there's a lot of scholarship I've put into all this stuff. So let's just say this. The really cool part about this idea of mass displacing as you go towards light speed is that matter as we know it right now is already whirling around almost at light speed inside of itself. So that means that this is a, a secret where if you had a way to nudge the velocity inside the atom over the light speed boundary, which again, traditional skeptics would say, oh, that's impossible, that's impossible. Mm -hmm. But the light speed that we've already had measured has been proven to be quite variable. You know, it's not a solid measurement at all. It's, uh, it totally has fluctuations. And so the whole idea that it's a constant really was just an assumption based on inaccurate observations that didn't have the scientific precision we do now. So my point in saying all this to you guys is that when you get into the alternative science, when you get into the alternative physics, you discover that there are ways in which you can accelerate an atom over the light speed boundary. And when you do that, you now have teleportation. You can displace mass into an alternative reality. And in that alternative reality, space works very differently and you can traverse much greater distances at speeds greatly in excess of the speed of light. So this is a whole branch of science. I mean, as you can probably imagine, I could give you a two-hour discourse just on this little chunk of it. But the idea is that just like the Wright brothers, it took them four years to prove that they actually had achieved powered flight. And they couldn't even get it done in the U.S. They had to go to France because people in the U.S. were literally seeing the plane fly, seeing photographs of it flying, and they still didn't believe it. It's the same thing that's going on right now. We think we're at the top of the, of the ladder, and we really haven't even started climbing. You know, I completely agree with that observation, David, because one thing that we, we've learned, we being our species, of course, is that the more closely we investigate a lot of things that were thought to be 
constants, universal absolutes, the rules of reality. The closer we we investigate and scrutinize these things, uh, the more we learn about our own current ignorance. You know, like uh, if you had uh, – I, I believe – like there's a terrible example of this, which is the uh, doctor – who advocated washing one's hands before conducting surgery. The man was dr- <laughs> driven out of his profession uh, for asking people to do something that, even if it didn't work, was not a- an inconvenience at all. That's ridiculous. Right. And it's a, yeah, that's, that's his, the reenactment. And so it's a dangerous assumption, isn't it, that to say that we do know everything there is to know when the opposite is, is clearly the case – and to your point, for something to uh, traverse that cosmic gulf, they would almost certainly have to be using methods of transportation that are unknown to our civilization. If we could talk a little bit about how this relates to uh, life on Earth, I'd be very interested. I know our listeners would be very interested in this too, in learning your perspective on how extraterrestrial contact uh, may have occurred in the ancient past and and whether it has occurred in the more recent past or even in the modern day. Right. Well, this is another very valid subject to inquire about. Um, There are so many structures around the world that are made of, you know, 100 ton blocks of stone, in some cases, over a thousand tons, like with the Trilithian in uh, Baalbek, Lebanon. You know, you have these slabs that are literally the size of a city block, and the, the heaviest one weighs like 1,680 tons. There's absolutely nothing on Earth that we have that even would remotely be able to manipulate uh, blocks of this weight. And They're on every continent except Antarctica that we know of, and nobody can explain this. So it really kind of, to use a psychological term, it's it's a mass cognitive dissonance that we all have, that we assume that societies that are less advanced than we are, societies where men are walking around wearing towels around their waists, you know, and not even the kind of clothes that we would have that they're somehow going to, you know, butter up these logs and roll them up the hill and roll the stones into position. It's, it's, it's totally ludicrous. And just to take that data point as, as something that we know for a fact, and then you go down to Peru, Saxe Woman, and you look at these uh, stones that are, in some cases, 100 tons, 500 tons, that are literally pushed together as if they just melted together. And you can't even fit a razor blade in between the cracks, but yet there's no mortar holding them together. It's it's absolutely in defiance of all of our logic and all of our science. So the only actual logical choice left using the principle of Occam's razor, which is that the simplest explanation has to be the right one. This is not the work of primitive people. It can't be. Therefore, it has to be the work of people who came here from somewhere else, some type of intelligent life that came here, that, or at least also some type of civilization that had reached a level of advancement on Earth that is greater than our own. So then you cue the anthropologists, and the anthropologists are going to say, well, show me one broken piece of pottery, show me one, you know, where's the Chatal Hoyuk, where's the uh, ancient settlement that we dug up that shows all the progression of the technology up to this point. We don't have it. Well, yeah, exactly, dude. So you have to have craft coming in here from somewhere else. And then what are they going to do? They're going to use the native building materials because they didn't bring any building materials with them. And if you want to build something that's going to last a really long time, make it out of stone. So there you have it. It's it's so simple, and it amazes me that uh, government-controlled PSYOP, a psychological operation dating back to the 1940s, has created such an immense aura of ridicule if you even dare to talk about this and ask these questions that everybody just stayed quiet nobody dared to ask because they didn't want to be ostracized by their peers and lose their job and lose their livelihood and with that let's take a quick word from our sponsor and we'll be right back 
And we're back. So speaking of perhaps ancient civilizations with high levels of technology, in uh, in just the trailer even for Above Majestic, there is a quote in there from Robert Oppenheimer uh, that's, I believe, from the same interview he gave where he said, uh, he quoted the Bhagavad Gita and said, now I am become death, destroyer of worlds, when talking about the Trinity nuclear weapon test or the Trinity test. And uh, you you mentioned something in there, and I'd just love for you to talk about it a little bit about the other technology that seems to exist within that book. Well, certainly, um, as as you guys and your listeners may or may not know, I'm one of the top uh, repeating talents on the Ancient Aliens show on History Channel. I'm in approximately 126 episodes. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Um, and so, anytime that you go to History Channel on a Friday. From 10 a.m. Friday morning to 1 a.m. Saturday morning, that's all they air now all day long. So I'm getting a lot of exposure on History Channel. And this show, Ancient Aliens, incidentally, is the number one most viewed television program in the country of India, meaning that out of all the selections that are available on television, there's more hours and more people watching Ancient Aliens than anything else which I find fascinating. Um, And so on Ancient Aliens, we have very consistently returned to the ancient Hindu scriptures because there is such a wealth of bizarre and fascinating information in there. And even what we cover on the show really only barely begins to scratch the surface of how far you can take that investigation. So let me just paint a picture for you now of what you get when you read these texts. First of all, we are looking at a society in which there are very sharply divergent types of human-looking people coexisting. You have people that look like we do conventionally. You have people who are taller than those folks that have blue skin. And we still see the depictions of Krishna all over the place. And everybody just assumes, oh, that's a mythology. That's got to be some kind of artistic rendering. And maybe the blue indicates that he's so highly spiritual. No, no, no. This is what they looked like. This, there were people in India that had a, a skin that was blue. That's, that's not a speculation. This is all part of their documented history. They took it very seriously. And the oldest artworks are thousands of years old that depict people looking like like this. Another interesting area that I do say in that trailer you mentioned is there are uh, different types of beings that are referred to in the Bhagavad Gita, the Mahabharata, and the other Vedic texts uh, that they call Rakshasas or Takshasas. Those are two different words. And another colloquialism they use for them is snakes. And when you read about these beings, it's clear. I mean, they have names. They have very strange names. And they appear to look like uh, a reptilian human being. So in other words, they have the two arms, two legs, the, the head, two eyes, nose, mouth. But yet at the same time, they also look as if a snake had been rendered into a human form. And there are very intense wars that are described between these reptilian types, the types with blue skin, the human types. And these battles also are recorded as occurring with the use of a certain type of craft they call Vimana. And the craft are described as, you know, there's no visible sign of propulsion coming out of them. They have advanced weapons technology, including what appears to be the use of laser type weapons or particle beam type weapons. Uh, they have clear anti-gravity properties. They have a humming noise as they operate. They appear to be able to phase shift so they could fly right into the ground or fly through the ocean or fly through a mountain. And the wars that these beings are fighting with each other included what appears to be the use of nuclear weapons. And so as we ask in the movie, how the heck do you get such a precise description of the exact nature and trauma of the nuclear bomb in a text that by anybody's estimate is at very least 3000 years old. 
So I guess the big question then is, over time, has all of that technology, if it existed, just been buried to a certain point where it's inaccessible or, or decayed? Or Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I'd like to answer that question in what might appear to be a divergence, but it's not going to be. It'll come back to the question's point really quickly. Okay. <laughs> so... <laughs> And I'm going to I'm going to come back to this thing called the Siberian Roswell. And you'll see why this is important. OK, one of the things we did cover on ancient aliens um, and I, as a consulting producer, I had a lot of effect on what shows were chosen and what the topics were. Um, and this is one of the ones that I recommended. So it's important to understand that. The use of nuclear weapons on a widespread scale, apparently the electromagnetic pulse that these weapons create and the amount of destructive force and actual movement that these weapons create is sufficient to change the energetic signature of the earth so that it balances on a different rotational axis. And so the real tragedy of this civilization uh, from the Vedic text, you know, conventional scholars assume these texts are between three to 5,000 years old. But the actual texts themselves date themselves as being 18,000 years old. And there are also very interesting undersea ruins that have been found uh, off the coast of India of areas that are clearly built like the temples that we see in India, many of which are pyramid-like in the way they're built. But then these areas underground, underwater, uh, they... Clearly, we know they could not have been above the water for 12,000 years just based on stratigraphy and the uh, natural progression of how the ocean levels have changed over time. So we already have archaeological evidence in which you have these temples. They're made out of stone. They have the carvings in them and the writings and inscriptions in them that correspond to what's in the Vedic texts. And they are undersea in areas that geologists will openly acknowledge have not been above sea for 12,000 years. Therefore, what we appear to be dealing with in the records of India is one side of this battle with an advanced civilization that has been come to be called Atlantis. And Atlantis, remember, was started by uh, Plato, who actually had gotten it from the wisest man in Greece at the time, a man called Solon. And this Greek philosopher had actually been granted privileged access to the Egyptian priesthood. And this Egyptian priesthood uh, was connected to the pyramids, and they had told Solon about the legend of a lost civilization, and that this civilization was far more advanced than we were at that time, and that there had actually been multiple civilizations that had come and gone. So this is where the Atlantis legend comes from. It's from Plato's Timaeus and Critias texts. And it's very difficult for people to take this seriously because of the alleged size of the continent, you know, where, the, where they're saying it's bigger than Libya and it's in the middle of a giant ocean. The big plot twist that everybody is starting to see now is that Atlantis is what we now call Antarctica. It's the same landmass but that as a result of this nuclear exchange, that the Earth's axis changed and that landmass did flood, like the legend says, but then the floodwaters froze. So it's very likely that if we were to go under the ice in Antarctica, if we could, if we were allowed to, and that's another big thing, that we would find a lot of very amazing ancient ruins down there that look similar to the stone stuff we see all over the world. But then you also have the idea that if Antarctica moved into a cold position, then so did Siberia. Siberia was not the cold wasteland that it is now. And so it's very fascinating to note that in the 1940s, um, Stalin had heard about, Joseph Stalin, the dictator of Russia, had heard about the Roswell incident. And he was aware that the United States had come into possession of some kind of hardware from alleged extraterrestrials. There was a story about somebody digging up a weird missile in the 1910s, and Stalin went back to that location, and the, the person who had originally found the missile, basically like a steel-looking fuselage, um, 
they couldn't dig it out of the ground. They didn't have the equipment or the staff or the money. So Stalin goes back there in the 1940s and finds the location where this weird missile was located. And they dig it up. Now, this is where the story gets very, very bizarre. Because the missile was covered in Sanskrit. Now, Sanskrit is the primitive language, which is really not primitive. It's apparently an extraterrestrial language. It was brought here from somewhere else. But Sanskrit is the language that the Hindu scriptures were written in. Okay, So now you have this weird missile-like object that's dug up. It's got Sanskrit inscriptions on it. And it has a level of technology that is way, way in excess of chemically propelled rockets that we have now. In addition to this, they found a vault. There was a vault down there. And this is all documented, by the way. This is accepted mainstream Russian history. I'm not making this up. You can look it up. It's called Russian Roswell. They found a vault down there. And inside the vault, it was like some kind of a capsule or chamber. There were a series of books. And these books were written in some cases in Sanskrit, in some cases in unidentifiable languages. And it had pictures in them of things like spaceships and space stations with detailed blueprint diagrams on how to construct them. And so the Soviet Union got their hands on this stuff, and that allowed for there to be this covert arms race between the U.S. and the USSR, where both sides are using recovered technology to build these unacknowledged anti-gravity spacecraft in this basically like a war with each other over who can get this stuff the fastest under the cover of national security, because as soon as your enemy knows you have something, it's not going to be a useful weapon anymore. So all of this kind of history has been suppressed from the public, unfortunately. And there's there's a very salient, I would say, crucial fact to add here. Um, I want to go back just briefly. There are probably some people in the audience who are going to say, well, if there were some sort of ancient nuclear war thousands and thousands of years ago, why isn't there a higher um, amount of radioactivity occurring in some places? But we have to remember that the fact is that um, some of the most dangerous substances of this nature are like cesium-137, strontium-90, and they both have half-lives of only 30 and 28 years. So a nuclear a nuclear uh, war, nuclear exchange could occur and ha- with so much time passing, we we can't assume that we would run into some place with fantastically high radiation, which makes it more plausible than some people might initially believe. But this the, – when we're in the modern day, what I, what I love um, – what I love about you exploring uh, the concept of secret technological wars is that – it's it's absolutely no secret at all that the U.S. military has a massive gargantuan black budget, you know, funds for classified purposes, but most, if not all, of what that money pays for is a secret. Uh, wh- what do you think happens with those trillions and trillions of dollars spent by the Pentagon? Do you think any of that goes into programs similar to what you just described between the Russians and the U.S.? Yeah, absolutely. Unquestionably. Uh, I have one of the insiders who has not come forward yet, but has said that he would, um, is a guy who actually worked at places like Area 51, um, working directly in concert with human looking extraterrestrial beings. Uh, And they talk very matter of factly about this. When you get to this level of the military industrial complex, they have open relations with a wide variety of extraterrestrial beings, most of which look like us or approximately similar. In fact, the the, the gray type is about as dissimilar as a lot of them end up looking. They Most of them look a lot more like us than you would think, and this is where you get the ancient legends of gods and this kind of stuff. But before I go further down that road, I just want to loop back to something else you said, because there was an implicit assumption that you made, which is that there is no evidence of a nuclear exchange. Mm -hmm. That is actually not true. Uh, um, The the very well-known geologist, Robert Schock, who has always been uh, a fixture in the ancient alien community going back to the 1990s uh, with his speculations on the water weathering on the backside of the Sphinx and how you see clear evidence of erosion on the back of the Sphinx that looks like many thousands of years of water running down. 
and carving these smooth curves into it. That's that's what he's most known for in our community, the ancient astronaut community. But also, Robert Schock's latest work is showing that throughout the entire northern hemisphere of the Earth, if you go back through the geological layers and you go back to about 12,500 years ago, thereabouts, there is a five-inch thick layer of black ash all over the northern hemisphere. Whoa. Fascinating. And it has microcrystalline spheres in it. It has these uh, microtectites, as they're called, these tiny little crystalline objects that basically represent the superheat of the nuclear blast, taking all these pieces of dirt and immediately turning them into little glass balls that are microscopic. And there is that stuff, literally five inches thick layer of this black ash all over the Northern Hemisphere. And then also we've discussed how there are actual still existing radioactive hotspots in various places in the Northern Hemisphere, including an area around the Great Lakes uh, that is exactly, exactly the type of radiation that you would expect after nuclear exchange. Another great example that we talked about on Ancient Aliens is in the Sahara Desert, where you actually have this green glass that people were picking up and they were getting radiation poisoning from it. And this is what happens when a bomb goes off over, like in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, people were picking up these pieces of glass and then they were dying from them because it looked beautiful, but it was highly radioactive. So the, 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 the proof of that ancient nuclear exchange is easy to make. It's just that it's not popularized. It's something that's been suppressed from us. And this gets back to the second part of what you said, which is this national security state and the suppression of where all of our money is going. You know, why is the Pentagon saying that they're losing trillions of dollars? They can't find it. And so getting back to my friend who worked on eight, eight different types of anti-gravity that he learned from actual extraterrestrials teaching him this and then doing the engineering work. Is that Bob Lazar? Um, Oh, no, no, no. Okay, okay. This is a guy who's never come forward. Um, he may want to come forward. We've talked about it. Uh, it would be fascinating if he did because he would be saying a lot of the same things that others have said. He is one of the people I know who visited our covert bases in Antarctica. There are uh, hot spots geologically down there from volcanic activity where the ice melts and it's like a cave. And the Germans discovered it first with their submarines. They could sail into these caves, and then they find out that there's land in there that you can walk around on. And if you light it up and, you know, take a look at it, you can actually wear a T-shirt in there. It's nice and warm from the volcanoes. Oh. Uh, so there's ruins down there. There's actual pyramids and stone structures and all that kind of stuff. And there's a huge, huge covert presence down there. And I have been given various code names of what it's called. That's one of the ways that I figure out who's real is there's things that I don't disclose. But I've spoken to lots of different insiders who have actually been down there and they've been under the ice in Antarctica. And the really, really amazing thing, of course, is uh, that there is a gigantic three mile wide spaceship that they found under the ice in Antarctica. It crash landed before it was all covered with ice. This thing is totally amazing. Um, and they've been inside of it. They've seen the rooms that people live in. Uh, they had a very interesting system where all the waste from the bathroom is then uh, pumped into, everybody had like a backyard inside the ship, so it appears that you're outdoors. There's like a holographic projection where it looks like the sky, and then your own bodily waste is used to, funnel into the growth of trees and grass and all the stuff that you have in your yard inside this mothership. And another thing that was fascinating was they found many smaller craft inside the large craft. And those craft look exactly like the ancient Hindu depictions of the Vimana. So wherever these people in the Vedas came from, the Hindu Vedas, it appears that our government has found their ship in Antarctica. Uh, and there's been investigations where they're analyzing the debris and the wreckage all the way back to the 1950s. There's some very strange stuff this stuff does. You can, you can sing to the metal 
and it will change shape and form. You can tell it what you want to do and it will do it. Um, so it's way, way more advanced than the stuff that we have now. And I've had various insiders tell me that they are really jealous that I've been briefed on this stuff and that I'm allowed to talk about it right now because they are planning on telling us about this stuff in the future, but there's a lot of guys that wish they could talk about it right now, but they're not authorized to yet. They're jealous of me that I get to talk about it on how stuff works. <laughs> the, this this brings us to uh, something that may be a little bit of a personal question, but we know tons of people in our audience are wondering this. Uh, have you or your associates ever um, been threatened or harassed or intimidated, or have you ever felt that you were not safe uh, due to the nature of your investigations? Absolutely, without question. Uh, there are very powerful groups that have kept this information hidden from us for a variety of different reasons. And I'll give you a couple examples of why they would want to keep it secret. First of all, if you guys have ever done examinations of how stuff works in history, right? Mm -hmm. And you got into an examination of how war works, then you would know that if, for example, you look at a period of history where everybody has bronze weapons and then somebody comes out with steel, the steel is going to destroy the bronze, right? So everybody with those steel swords is going to destroy the bronze. Similarly, if you go back to a time in history where everybody is fighting with bows and arrows, and then somebody comes out with a crossbow, the guys with the crossbows are going to completely devastate the people with bows and arrows. Whoever has the most destructive and effective technology in a war is the winner, right? Can yeah, we agree on that? That's yeah, correct. Absolutely. So therefore, if you are a national security state, if your goal is to make sure that your position of power is not threatened, why in the world would you want to tell the enemy, which in this case is the mass public, and therefore anybody who could start to do things at home, why would you tell the enemy that you have a superior weapon? That's a good point. It's a great question because we know that we know that there's solid there's solid compelling evidence that at least in the case of the U.S. military, uh, they are in possession of technologies that the average public is unaware of and doesn't have access to until years after their invention. And let's pause there just for a moment. We're going to hear a word from our sponsor and we'll be right back. You know, personally, my I oscillate uh, between some skepticism and then like full on believer of things. And in this case, like when we're talking about that massive spaceship uh, down beneath the ice in Antarctica, I what makes you personally believe through the accounts of others that this thing is real? Well, I understand the difficulty that you're facing, and it's a difficulty that I've faced as well. Um, I'm standing on the mountaintop now, and I get to look down at the whole path I took to get here, which has taken me 30, 35 years. And much of this information came to me after many, many years of not having it and working very hard and risking my life, as you were just talking about, to get this information. Uh, then when you actually can stand on the mountaintop and see the whole road and talk about it in nice, concise information chunks like this and on a radio show, it would appear completely fantastic and completely ridiculous. And, and so I, I empathize with you because I am also a skeptic. I actually, it's so funny because when I do public events, people come up to me and they, they get wild eyed and they have all these amazing and fantastical stories that I no, are probably not true in a lot of cases, but everybody assumes that I have this gapingly open mind. And in fact, as weird as the things that I'm saying are, I wouldn't ever want to bring something up to you guys on a show like this if it wasn't something I've independently heard from four or five different insiders who have proven to me that they worked at very highly classified levels for the military industrial complex. In other words, I've seen the documents. I've confirmed that they did serve in the military. I've confirmed, I've seen pictures of them with, you know, very significant governmental figures in certain cases. There's no doubt in my mind. And, um, 
you, when you start to have 10, 15, 20 different people that you can talk to who all have similar stories. And then when you're talking to one of them, uh, it's interesting. I just brought my wife in on a call the other day with one of my old insiders uh, who I hadn't spoken to in a while, who we call Jacob in my book, Ascension Mysteries. And we actually ended up talking to him for five hours. And the, the scope of the conversation, the level at which Jacob and I talk, the speed with which information comes out, the complexity of the information, how interlocking it is, how amazingly deep and complex it is, it's impossible that somebody could make this up as performance art. It's literally impossible. So we have had several different folks who independently had the same code names for these programs. They were aware that this ship is down there. They've actually put their hands on it. They've seen the inscriptions. They've gone inside. They've been down in Antarctica. They've talked about how they got there. They've talked about the protocols, the procedures. And there's just so many things that they say that overlap with each other without them knowing what each other actually said to me. That, as I've said before, either I'm the victim of the greatest, most sophisticated disinformation campaign in Earth's history, <laughs> uh-huh. or this is actually true. This is very, that's very well put. And we we want to thank you so much for your time, David, but we, we feel like there's still just just a few questions. We it, It's weird. Matt, sure, and I, sure. Matt and I were talking about this before we got on air, and we, we were thinking there's no way that we're going to get to all of this stuff mm-hmm. uh, or to give it, you know, give it a, anything more than uh, a sort of broad uh, scrutiny or a broad introduction for because many people will – have been somewhat familiar with these concepts on a surface level. And hopefully they'll want to go see Above Majestic. Right, right. Uh, that's that's one of the questions that we wanted to end on today. It's it's sort of a two-part question. Uh, the, the first is um, what, what has inspired you to create Above Majestic and what do you hope – uh, the audience, including our audience, uh, learns from it. What, what changes after they have after they have watched the work? Well, again, we're uh, you, you guys are double clicking on something that has ten thousand references. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> how how much of a cosmic download of of plate spinning do you want me to do, and how many plates do you want spinning <laughs> before you've had enough and you? <laughs> You say, yeah, I'm full. I got to go now. I gotta go. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> well, so we didn't really start to get into the topics that Above Majestic covers yet in our interview here. And that would be the, the central glue that holds the whole film together is this idea of a secret space program or a secret NASA and how long this has been going on for. Um, and this is another area in which, like many of the things we've been talking about, it does require a very flexible mind to properly appreciate what's going on. Now, now I will say this, even if a person is a skeptic and they are inclined to think that this stuff is not true, there is a pretty extraordinary learning curve just to familiarize yourself with what the insiders are saying is really going on. In other words, if you wanted to debunk this, if you wanted to discredit this without just making blanket generalizations, which is usually what they do, where they will attack the character of the speaker like myself, and by making some kind of rude character assault, they feel that they're invalidating all this hardcore evidence. But if you actually wanted to go beyond that and try to take a legitimate skeptical inquiry of the data, First, you have to become aware of what the data is. And that learning curve has taken me years. And this is with multiple insiders who I would speak to sometimes two hours a week for years on on end. And every single conversation, I'm learning all this stuff that I didn't hear before. So I would say the first step to understanding what's going on is that it is vastly, vastly, vastly complex. It's so much more complex than people could even imagine that it's very, very tough to give people a sense of how much they've been lied to, because that in and of itself is a huge violation 
we have been given a construct of reality. We believe that we understand reality when the actual greater reality around us is vastly larger. So if you go back now, and I would say probably most of your listeners could accept, at least on principle, that the Roswell crash may have actually been some kind of extraterrestrial advanced craft. The, the evidence for this is irrefutable. There's, you know, our former NASA astronaut, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, personally interviewed over 70 different witnesses to the Roswell crash who saw this thing, who saw the bodies, who saw it being hauled onto low boys and, 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 and you know, driven to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. The people who checked it into Wright-Patterson, the people who saw it in the hangar, the people who saw the bodies inside these tubes filled with blue liquid. I mean, it's it goes on and on and on. So let's just say, as stage one of our philosophical premise we're building, Roswell really happened, okay? Roswell was 1947. That's 71 years ago. So if we are then saying that our military-industrial complex got access to fully operational hardware that could be used to traverse our galaxy, and they had this 70 years ago, don't you think maybe they figured out how to build it, how to get it working again, how to jumpstart the car, jumpstart the engine? And even back to 1997, we have Colonel Philip Corso, a witness who came forward and said that many technologies that we have developed came from the Roswell crash. And he mentioned fiber optic cables. He mentioned computer chips. Because remember, we go from vacuum tubes where like the Univac computer, the reason why the word bug is used, right, is one insect got inside that thing and it broke the whole computer because its little body hit the glass on one of these vacuum tubes and it melted the glass. And then they have to go through this massive basketball court-sized room of vacuum tubes to find which one got the bug. And then all of a sudden, we get solid-state transistors in 1947 from Motorola. And then very shortly thereafter, we start getting computer chips where the transistors are printed onto a wafer of silicon. Now, what's so crazy is that when Corso came out with the fact that it wasn't just, you know, fiber optics and computer chips, it's also LED lights, it's lasers, it's Velcro, it's Kevlar. And he says this in 1997, I had already gotten the exact same information and the exact same pieces of technology disclosed to me that they came from Roswell a year before from an insider I met at a UFO conference. And then even before that, a buddy that I had in, in college had gotten this from his physics professor who was the head of the department in 1993. Same information again. And then it comes out in a book five years after, four years after I first hear about it. So to me, the concept that Roswell really happened is irrefutable because I've been sitting on this knowledge about computer chips, LED lights, infrared night vision, all this stuff being reverse engineered from extraterrestrial technology. I'd had this for years, and then it comes out from a new witness. Well, then the questions I start asking, this is again back in 97, is, well, oh my God, if they have interstellar craft 70 years ago, what are they doing with it? Where are they going? And obviously, now the idea of NASA Apollo missions to the moon, it's, it's a laughable joke. They're, they're way, way, way beyond that. So now you have to kind of double click on that and say, well, my God, if they've had these craft, if they can build them, if they can fly out of our atmosphere and fly through the solar system, and fly through the galaxy, what haven't they done? How many bases have they built? How many locations do they have where there are people working? Then you start hearing from insiders like Pete Peterson, who actually worked with the Reagan administration. They called him Dr. Dew because he was the leading expert on classified technology for the Reagan administration. And he came forward to me in 2009. Peterson is saying, yeah, we've had Americans all over the galaxy. There's like 35 different bases we have all throughout the galaxy with Americans working at them today. And he talked about how in the 1950s, they did this thing called the brain drain, mostly from third world countries, a lot of people from Brazil. Uh, and what they did is they recruited millions and millions of people 
uh, they estimate something like 55 to 65 million people that were brought out in the 1950s from a lot of, they were very, the, the cream of the crop, you know, the most educated, the most intelligent, the most savvy technology experts. They brought them out into this world that they were building in space and they've never come back and they have a mandatory breeding program. They have to have children and they live a very regimented life. And most of these people have been told that the earth was destroyed in a nuclear war in the 1980s. So they don't even think they can come home. And so there's literally what Rich Dolan has called a breakaway civilization. There's a whole separate world that's going on out in space and they are not allowed to have any contact with us and we are not allowed to have any contact with them. And this is just some of the amazing stuff that we get into in Above Majestic. So it is a, a film really about the secret space program, which has never been done before. Nobody's ever made a film like this. And, and we certainly did not expect that it was going to debut at number one on Apple and Amazon. But I think that shows how amazing the demand is for people to hear about these out of the box alternative concepts. Oh yeah, man. It's a fascinating watch. I, you know, even the most hardcore skeptics, as you say, are going to find things in there that's, it's going to blow their mind a little bit. Um, and at least I don't see how it couldn't. <laughs> yeah. And at least send them down rabbit hole after rabbit hole of their own research, which is, I think one of the best things you can do uh, for someone is just send them on their own journey. Yeah. And I do want to point out, to everybody listening that in the film, uh, several of the people that are that are speaking about this or that have, as you said, David, come forward with their identities, they they are people who, as you said, have been vetted. They mm -hmm. did actually oh, yeah. work in the military. They're not – I guess what I'm trying to say is it's not just some random person from – across the street some, you know? not just a blogger or something <clears throat> right. um it's yeah it's, not at all yeah not at all anybody who made the cut and got into that film did so because they had proven themselves to be authentic wow and and like you said it is available now on apple and on amazon i'm looking at it on amazon prime right now you can well i won't say how much it costs because it might change uh, when you're hearing this or whatever <laughs> but uh but it's available right now as this is being recorded well uh, and what's also amazing is that it started out as only a purchase where you have to actually buy the movie for $14.99 uh, when it first debuted. And now we have it available as a rental. So if you if you have a casual interest, you just want to watch it once, you can rent it. Um, however, buying it does include a treasure trove of special features that I'm speaking in where this kind of level of conversation we've been having just goes on and on and on for hours. Uh, so it's definitely worth it to get the whole thing. But yeah, if you, if you have a casual interest, you just want to rent it, you're, you're bored and you got a big, big bowl of popcorn. <laughs> um, you can, you're probably going to end up eating the whole thing and have indigestion because you, this is not a comfortable film to watch. It's a very uh, thought provoking and in some degrees an anxiety provoking movie. And, uh, you know, if I could go back and do anything differently based on some of the feedback we've had, I would just say to people, yeah, we, we kind of break the shell of the consensus reality. It is a little shocking. It is a little disturbing. But the good part is that this stuff is true, even if maybe certain aspects of what we think we know turn out to be incorrect or need to be modified somehow. The overall investigation is extremely sound. And the, the real spring-loaded fascinating thing for humanity is that once this stuff is declassified, we immediately go into a Star Trek reality. We will be mm. able to visit other planets. We will be meeting extraterrestrials. We will be working on spaceships. There's an extraordinary amount of extraterrestrial ancient ruins that they simply don't have enough people to explore right now. So understand that the amount of archaeology that has been found because our solar system is actually in a very popular part of our galaxy, We're right next to a big stargate that goes to other galaxies. It's something I talk about in Ascension Mysteries. There is good NASA science that proves that it's there. Okay. So we are a very heavily trafficked solar system. There's lots and lots of civilizations that have come and gone from here going back more than 2 billion years. So as a result, there's an incredible amount of archaeology that needs to be done 
There's entire cities, entire ruined bases that have never really been explored that have unbelievable significance in terms of archaeology. I mean, absolutely, utterly dwarfing the discovery of King Tut's tomb and all the cool stuff that was in there. We're talking about cities that held millions of people with their own technology, with their own writing, that are literally sitting there abandoned, and we know where they are, and we have the technology to get there, but this secret space program doesn't have anywhere near enough staff to go and explore them. Some of them are on the moon. There's a lot of them actually in the Earth. There are plenty of them on Mars. There's plenty of them on other moons in our solar system, the moons of Jupiter, the moons of Saturn. They are loaded with this so-called cosmic junkyard. And this is some dumpster diving that I would be very happy to do because you might find dumpster treasures in there like you can't even imagine. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you again so much for joining us and speaking at length uh, with us about this. It, it's really been our pleasure and, you know, it, it just keeps our, keeps our mind going and we definitely want to believe and want to explore all this stuff further. Well, I appreciate that. And, and again, this is something that you can see in a movie. It's a nice two hour, 12 minute download that, uh, we really put a lot of time and energy into. It's got a lot of great graphics and effects, and it is well worth the time invested to see. Um, you don't have to believe that it's true, but even if you just look at it as sci-fi, it is a very entertaining roller coaster ride. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, I was I was going to throw in the same thing. It's a wild ride indeed. Uh, David Wilcock, again, thank you for coming on to the show and introducing our audience to uh, some mind-blowing concepts here. We do also want to mention that if you would like to learn more about David's work outside of Above Majestic, you can visit his website, divinecosmos.com. That's correct. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate you bringing me on. Awesome. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, that's all for us today, folks. Uh, we will be and that's the end of this classic episode. If you have any thoughts or questions about this episode, you can get into contact with us in a number of different ways. One of the best is to give us a call. Our number is 1-833-STDWYTK. If you don't want to do that, you can send us a good old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iheartradio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.